Hello and welcome to SAR Histories, where on the channel today we will be visiting the beautiful Stokesay Castle. Settled on a gently rising ground in the valley of the River Oni, Stokesay Castle seems a permanent feature of the landscape. Although there were earlier structures on the site, almost everything visible at Stokesay today was built in the 1280s and early 1290s by Lawrence of Ludlow, a wool merchant who had become one of the richest men in England. Shortly after the present gatehouse was built in 1640-1641, the Civil War led to the demolition of most of the curtain wall. Before then, there were probably storerooms along these walls and a protective cover over the well to keep dust and dirt out of the water. A visitor to Stokesay in the early 1290s would surely have been struck by its owner's wealth and taste even before he entered one of the buildings. But the wide open space of the hall must have been particularly impressive, all the more so for being clearly lit. Three large windows on the east side are matched on the west and the smaller blocked up window over the entrance has its counterpart in the one over the stair. The southernmost window on the west side was replaced by a doorway when the hall was used as a store in the 19th century. In the 13th century, as today, the visitor's eye must have been turned to the roof, to the splendid crook timbers covering the whole expanse of the hall. The two upper floors of the North Tower are reached from the hall via one of its most striking features, a wooden staircase. Like the roof, the staircase is a survival of the late 13th century and some of the carpenter's marks occur on both. This room has a fine wooden roof, similar to that of the hall, with the overhead rafters resting on a truss of diagonal beams and vertical king posts, supported by horizontal time beams. During the 17th century, a plaster ceiling concealed the roof timbers and what seems to have been a closet was inserted in the northwest corner. In the south wall, the elegant fireplace again displays the high quality of Lawrence's house. The semicircular columns with their carved corbels and capitals and the wooden mantle that rests upon them are all of the late 13th century. All that is missing is the hood, probably of plaster, which was once placed on the mantle and fastened to the wall above to lead the smoke up through the chimney flume. At the top of the first flight of stairs, a doorway of characteristic late 13th century design gives you access to the North Tower's first floor. Although now two rooms, originally the whole floor seems to have been occupied by one large room. The first partition was probably made of wood, but in the 17th century this was replaced by the existing wall. At the same time, the closet at the north end, set above the ice house or scullery in the basement, was created as a latrine, with a door and a wooden lath partition to provide privacy and exclude smells. At the other end of the hall stands the two-storey solar block. Lawrence probably used this for his own living quarters before he built the South Tower. The door in the hall's southeast wall gives access to the ground floor, 
which was originally a large single room with a cellar, reached down a flight of stairs. It was probably used mainly as a storeroom, a function emphasised by its 17th century adaptation that divided the room down the middle and set panelling and cupboards in the wall behind the hall. Perhaps at some point it became a dining room with food from an outside kitchen and drink from a cellar passed through the hatch cut in the dividing wall. This room, which is lit only by two small windows, them little more than a slit, protected by a moat below and set directly beneath his own dwellings at the farthest point in the castle from its entrance. This was probably Lawrence's strong room, a secure repository for money and perhaps wool. At the top of the stairs from the hall leads into the solar, originally a private apartment for Lawrence and his family. Like many other rooms in the castle, but more extensively than most, the solar was refurnished in the 17th century, probably about the time that the gatehouse was replaced. The 17th century designer mostly respected the room's medieval outline, although the new ceiling hid the openwork roofing from sight. The fireplace stands where its predecessor stood. The panelling carefully framed the peepholes on either side of the fireplace through which earlier owners could observe what was happening in the hall, and although it covered some 16th century paintwork, it left untouched the windows and window seats in the west wall. The first floor of the South Tower is occupied by a single room lit by windows almost all the way around. Two are lancet, but four are large enough to contain seats. On a sunny day with views in almost every direction, this must have been a pleasant place to sit. As there are no grooves in the windows to hold glass, the shutters would have been closed in bad weather and warmth provided by the fire in the east wall. Before the fire in 1830, this room on the second floor was reportedly divided into three by wooden partitions, but originally it probably formed a single room like the one beneath, with two windows looking into the courtyard and the others facing south, and a fireplace in the east wall to provide warmth. The roof is now flat and made of lead covered by wooden slats, but once it was occupied by a small shed-like structure with a pointed wooden roof, perhaps for use by centuries during the Civil War. A turret on the north side of the tower provided an observation point, as indeed the whole roof still does. There are fine views in all directions, to the west is a pond that dates from the same period as the tower. Like the castle, the pond was both ornamental and practical. It enhanced the view of the castle from the west, but also provided an extra element of protection, acted as a potential water supply for the moat, and no doubt also contained fish.
Encircling the castle is the moat, which can be entered from the front of the gatehouse. It is not clear whether it was filled with water in the 13th century, but in 1731 an engraving by Samuel Nathaniel Bulk depicts the moat as filled with water, but there is no sign now of a water retaining clay lining to the bank. Even when dry, the moat would have been a formidable barrier to robbers and raiders, as the curtain walls would have been when they stood to their full height. The stub of the wall to the east of the south tower makes this very clear. As you walk the moat, you get a real sense of the castle's shape and elegance. Stokesay Castle is a beautiful place to visit, set in a historical area. It is one of the finest fortified manor houses in England, and a must for those that like history. If you have enjoyed this video and want to keep history alive, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. Until then... Goodbye.